Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, go to pond5.com slash frame rate. Sorry, new girl, but you should hear this now. We can never be friends. The cliques of Westeros Valley High aren't allowed to intermingle. High school politics. Wait, what? what? Cliques? Yeah, cliques. You know, Stark. Lannister. Baratheon. Greyjoy. And uh, Targaryen, apparently. Well, we can't be that different, right? I mean, we're we're young, we're hormonal, we all love. <laughs> And We're actually more of a dog family. And when we get to know each other, we'll realize all the wonderful things we have in common. We are Starks. Our way is the vintage way. And prom night is coming. But we call it Frame Rate. <laughs> frame Rate, episode 115. I'm Tom Merritt. That was amazing, Tom. I was so ready for the bizarre pronunciation of Framarate, but you, you got me again with your wizardry powers. Hey, man, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what this is in a bit. You probably figured out it's School of Thrones, but we'll explain what that means. Also, I snuck in a special guest. We have a friend in town who is the amazing motion graphics wizard behind all of the, He's the one who created the introduction for the NSFW movie draft. Uh, he does amazing uh, 3D After Effects compositions and stuff. Um, it's uh, your buddy of mine, Lonely Dot Geek, right here. Hey, everybody, Mister uh, Mister Zach Holder. <laughs> that so no is the sound enough of for me. Millions of hands clapping. Good to see you, Zach. Thanks for uh, hanging out. Hey, Tom. Glad South. How are you having a good South by Southwest? I've had a great time so far. Excellent. Well, uh, would you like to do the honors and introduce the big story? Wow! Do it! Do it! Oh, do it! Really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Wow. All right. The big story. This just in, the big story. Well done. And uh, we got lots of big stories today. We're going to start off with Cablevision and Viacom in a lawsuit. Cablevision suing Viacom saying... We had to pay a penalty of at least $1 billion in order to get the Viacom channels we wanted. All we wanted was MTV, Comedy Central, and Nickelodeon. They forced all these other crappy channels they run on us, like, I don't know, Palladia and Logo. Uh, and we didn't want them. And so we're suing for antitrust. And Viacom's like, what are you talking about? We, we, char we charged you what we would charge you to take our whole package. You get a discount if you take everything. And the fact that if you didn't want anything, you couldn't afford a higher amount, well, we're sorry. That's just the way it works. Besides, you do the same thing. In fact, James Dolan, uh, his family controls shares in AMC Networks. Viacom said, you do the same thing with Vi AMC. Uh-huh. You bundle all that stuff in. Now, granted, Cablevision and AMC are no longer part of the actual same company, but he's going after the family there, Brian. So here's the thing. This is a tough one for me because, uh, as you know, like I'm a, I'm a set fire to everything kind of guy. But um, if, if this is the agreement that is offered, if this is the contract offered, and if Cablevision has historically signed it, then it doesn't seem to me like you get to go back and then cry because you hate it. Like you can hate it all you want, Cablevision, but then just stop signing it and get your other buddies, Cablevision, to also not sign it. And that'll put pressure on them to open up a la carte. Like, I want a la carte purchases for everything, but I think this is the wrong way to go about it. Well, I don't necessarily agree with you there, uh, but I also don't necessarily disagree with you. Here's, here, here's what I agree with what you said and what I don't. They, they right. certainly have a case, right? Antitrust 
is a legal principle in the United States of America. And if you abuse your economic power uh, to to be anti-market, then you fall under the, the law and you're not allowed to do that, right? I mean, that we had trust busting back in the early 1900s for exactly that reason. So what I, Cablevision is alleging here is that Viacom is abusing their market position. So right. in that case, I disagree with you. I'm like, well, Cablevision has a right to complain, to say like, hey, wait a minute, this is, this is not the price that the market should set for this. Saying if you take... Some of our networks will charge you this much. And if you take all of our network, we'll charge you a billion dollars less. Doesn't make any sense. I totally agree with Cablevision there. Where I tend to kind of drift back towards your viewpoint is I'm not sure you can make an antitrust case when there are so many different competitors on the other side of this argument. Cablevision's got a virtual monopoly in most of its markets, right? <laughs> And as they're, you know, the ad, they're the antitrust side of this equation. Viacom has competitors. They have CBS out there, which is a different company, although owned by the same family, by the way. No, they're going back to the family thing. But also they've got NBC Universal and they've got Fox and they, there are other competitors. What Cablevision is saying is we can't not carry the Viacom networks and compete, but I'm not sure who they're competing with. I guess it's DirecTV and Dish. Well, and, and plus we've seen these chicken uh, games of chicken face-offs with carriers and people and under the terms that they're putting it out there. So I'm surprised that they didn't pay, play a game of chicken, but instead try to make a legal case here. Uh, there's a couple of things. Um, uh, yes, everything, all these complications, I agree with all of them. Uh, I want to bring another perspective from, uh, I'm going to pinch one of the letters we got from the feedback segment here, from Anthony, who says... Uh, I may be alone, but I want Cablevision to lose its lawsuit against Viacom. People want a la carte cable because they feel it will be cheaper. Well, it won't be. HBO costs about $20, and compared to larger channels like ESPN, AMC, and History Channel, it has low ratings. So it's saying, obviously, HBO is very expensive and yet gets many fewer views than these, uh, than these other ones. He says, I figure a la carte cable channels would cost $10 to $25 per channel, because the content creators are going to have to make up for their subscriber and advertising fees on ca on channels that don't make it. So we're going to have the same problem is what he's saying is like you're still going to have to make up for the losses that you have on Logo. But they're going to do it by raising the fees on ESPN. He says that uh, uh, content creators are going to make it up for their subscriber. Blah, 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 blah. Prices could be $10 to $25 per channel. If you want, if your family wants ESPN, Lifetime, Nickelodeon, and AMC, you're going to pay introductory cable prices for four channels, and these prices will jump when they kill off another channel. So he said, remember when people didn't want to pay for minutes on their cell phones? Well, we got our wish, and now we don't pay for texting. But when we didn't want to pay for text, text messages, we got the privilege of paying for data as a separate thing. He says he doesn't think there's a natural way to escape the heavy fee just a way to make more excuses for them to nickel and dime us on the channels that, that we really care about. Now, part of that, I actually totally agree. I think that if this goes through and they allow a la carte channels, first thing you're going to see is splitting them out so that the pie somehow becomes larger. So, to, so that somehow to get the exact same service that you're paying $80 a month for, you will now have to pay $160 a month for. Or you could just get less channels and still pay the exact same $80 a month which I think there's a good chance for. Yeah, I don't think it works out that way. Uh, I, I think it's one of those situations where overall, the at the very end of his email, I, I think he's got the right idea here. How he got there, I would I would pick at if I were to, to want to pick at it. But he says uh, the customer gets, let's see, where let me find the email actually here. He says, uh, I don't think there's a natural way to escape heavy fees in high demand, low competition business. And that's where I, he's nailed it. High yes. demand, low competition. The prices are always going to be set in favor of the incumbents. What I don't agree with is this uh, this analogy to HBO. HBO is an entirely different animal. Uh, they don't they don't run advertisers, and they build themselves as a premium channel with premium content. Uh, that's like you know somebody marketing the premium whiskey and saying, well, if all whiskeys are sold in the liquor store, then they're all going to be the same price as the premium. No, they're not. There's going to be bargain whiskey, and there's going to be bargain channels as well. And in fact, I think one of the arguments here is that what you would see. If this happened, if, if Cablevision were to win this, and I don't think they will, but if they were to win this and suddenly you couldn't use your market power to leverage ch your, your low power channels onto cable, uh, cable television, you'd just see fewer channels. You'd see a bunch of networks go out of business. I you would not see DIYs. You would not see logs. You wouldn't have to pay for them. Uh, I think your your cable bill would probably go down if you wanted it to, but you would have to take fewer channels. The argument is, well, I'm paying for all these channels I don't want. I think what you would see, and this is where I, I, I come back to agreeing with Anthony, uh, is that 
if you wanted to get the channels that you really still do want, you would end up paying more for all of those channels. The only way you would save money is if you restrict the channels to just the ones you watch most often. All right, Zach, I want you to chime in on this. That's one thing I was talking about, uh, thinking about earlier uh, when I first read the article was that, that um, this is uh, basically Cablevision and Viacom and these companies are going about this, the same thing we've been talking about for the past year about wanting to make an a la carte, you know, channels the way we want. So the idea that, that, you know, yes, it might cost more if you want just HBO, but not HBO 2, HBO Spanish, you know, Showtime, Cinemax, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, if they have companies that have agreements that you can say, hey, these are all the channels by Viacom. Which ones do you want? Like, I just want these, you know, five right here. Yeah, but but I, I guess my point is you're going to have that, but you're going to end up paying 80% of what you're paying now. Your, your discount is going to be $15 per month, and you're going to cut out 80% of your channels. And this is not me saying what I wish for. This is not me yeah. saying I'm glad about it or it's a bad idea. I want a la carte, but I don't trust these bastards. And yeah. I feel like the way, if, if there's an earthquake in their industry, all that's going to happen is they're going to figure out a way to turn that earthquake into giving us less content for more money. Well, they're going to they're going to try to keep those revenue streams equal. And but here's here's the positive side for you, Brian. What no matter who's right on that side of the argument, these are yep. people arguing over how much water they can carry in their buckets from a drying reservoir that is no longer getting water. They these are they, this this business model is dead in 10 years. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons you're seeing gutsy moves like Cablevision and lawsuits like Dish with Hopper because they realize the the power base is waning from these yeah. guys. In the past, it was unchallenged. It was unchallenged for 20, 30 years because if you are a Cablevision, you realize, well, I, I depend on these guys for my life. I, I don't have anywhere else to go. Now they do. They have lots of independent content being created and Cablevision say, you know, Optimum Online actually makes quite a bit of money for us. Uh, maybe we should go that route. This is a really good point because uh, you got to remember that the players in this industry do not take a short-term view of things. These are people who their shortest-term projects are, do we want to take on a two- to eight-year commitment of running Game of Thrones? You know, that kind of thing. These people uh, always are thinking about the long game, and they know exactly where things are headed. And when you're in that mindset, you figure, what does it matter? All this is going away. It's all going to change. Anyway, why don't we be the guys uh, who, who start dismantling this structure that we've enjoyed for the last 30 years? All right, well, let's move on to some good news in another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Now, I got really excited uh, a while back that Nielsen was going to start rating online viewing uh, along and, bun and, and sell it alongside television viewing. So it didn't matter what screen you were looking at. You could still be part of the rating. But we got a really interesting uh, experience from somebody that we'll get to in the feedback about how Nielsen has worked up until now. That's about to change. But here's the big deal. ABC is now selling all across the platforms. This is exactly what I wanted to happen. This is exactly what I hoped would happen. And I hope more networks jump on it soon. I think they will. Uh, what's going on is ABC Unified is the new plan that ABC is using, using the Nielsen online metrics to say, we are now selling our shows across the platform. So when you buy an ad, your ad is going to appear everywhere our show appears. Yes, and this is huge. Now, keep in mind, this is this is one of those weird moments where we sound like people who love ads. Of course, we don't like the inconvenience of ads any more than you guys do. But you must realize that if you like free, high-quality programming, the only way that's possible is with ads. And so uh, structurally, it's important. If you want better stuff available online, there needs to be a way to reliably deliver the advertising content along with it. And so uh, I would say that this is an even bigger decision. I mean, the Nielsen decision uh, to start tracking the online stuff was a, an important structural change that made possible this. And this is what's going to, yes, we'll all be watching ads, but the ads will be shorter. They'll be more targeted. They'll speak directly to you. You'll hate them less. They'll be less intrusive and you'll get more high quality programming in the online space. Yeah, I mean, let's do a few misconceptions to clear up. First of all, some people are like, I thought Nielsen already rated online. Nielsen net ratings is an online metric that uses tracking on your web browser to see what sites you visit. And they did have some video tracking there, but it was not like TV tracking and it was not unified. What we're talking about is Nielsen's new online campaign ratings 
that say, right. all right, ABC, you've got Grey's Anatomy on. Now we're not only going to rate it on the television, but if somebody's watching it through Hulu on the television or somebody's got the ABC.com app on their iPad, uh, whether they're streaming it to Apple TV or not, we're going to give you a rating for that. You can separate those, sell them separate if you want, which is actually what ESPN, another ABC company, is doing. Or you can roll them in together. And ABC, the main network, is saying, we're going to roll it all in together. We're going to sell it unified. When you buy an ad, it's everywhere. And as Brian explained, what's great about that for you is not that you get to see more ads. That's a, that's a downside to this, probably. You probably are going to see more ads. But you're going to be counted. And all of the stupid rules that say, well, you're going to have to wait 28 days to see that show online. Or we're only going to put five episodes of that show up and then we're going to yank them. They all have to do with that very fact that those didn't count. Those eyeballs didn't count in the main rating. What ABC wants is that main rating where they make all their money to be bigger. This makes it bigger if you and watch this, online. This is a boon to people who've been wanting to cut the cord because I'm I'm one of those people who I do 90% of, of what I watch is all online. It's either through my iTunes or through Hulu or uh, uh, streaming through through you know YouTube sites you know that kind of stuff, but there's still a few things that I have that are just because I I don't want to wait a month to watch it. I am like okay, I'll go ahead and, and pay for my Direct TV service and I'll keep it going for a little while longer. With Nielsen finally figuring out that people don't always want to watch their TV set, you know this is going to be a huge huge advantage to everybody who wants to finally go. I'm just going to do everything through my Apple TV or do everything through you know uh, is it the the queue from a uh, which they're still from which one uh, for for uh, Google they're still playing with oh I wouldn't even know yeah yeah but uh, regardless yes good for you is what we're saying good for you cord cutters you're gonna watch yes. ads and you're gonna be glad and now yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. These last big stories are smaller big stories than the first two big stories. But Netflix just this afternoon announced that they have launched a new website, ispspeedindex.netflix.com, that hey, lets you track yes. your Netflix speed by ISP across most of the countries in which Netflix occurs. Now, Netflix says right up front, these are not good ratings of the speeds of these ISPs. These are good ratings of the speeds Netflix viewers are getting which can be limited by their equipment can be limited by how many people are watching things at the same time but across like apples to apples when you compare what are the speeds the netflix customers on verizon are getting versus what are the speeds netflix customers on comcast are getting those numbers should compare because overall they're all experiencing the same kinds of disadvantages to getting peak performance this is huge because uh, many longtime viewers of this show and NSFW have, have heard me very loudly complain oh. that I couldn't understand why YouTube clips, even though it's like I got 30 megabits or whatever, everything should download instantly. I download stuff from Vimeo. It plays beautifully, high def instantly. Uh, but meanwhile, a, a, a YouTube clip will go forward a bit and then herky jerk and, and you can't run anything at 1080p without letting it pre-buffer or whatever. Uh, and this, uh, somebody forwarded over to me an article about how to hack your own uh, browser settings so that uh, it, it shut off certain ports that were used uh, that that force it to redirect and and actually use your full bandwidth. So there's there are gatekeepers. Your ISP is a gatekeeper. They need to manage a lot of traffic. They need to keep uh, an effective service to everyone. So they use some shortcuts here. This is what I would love to see from YouTube, but it's happening from Netflix. Essentially, they're calling out like without in a passive aggressive way. That's brilliant. They're saying uh, we're not saying why. We're not saying how. I'm just saying. This is how fast we're able to get stuff to you. Yeah, this and is the data we see. Now, some of these ISPs are partners, and they have Netflix machines in their data centers helping correct. to deliver video from the edge much faster. And, right. and they don't they don't call that out. They don't say that. They just kind of let the numbers speak for themselves. Yes, exactly, which is the right way to, for them to do it. And I wish – I don't know if Google has been uh, nice to the ISPs right now for some other reason. You know, I'm sure there's all kinds of behind-the-scenes politics. But uh, there's definitely some kind of throttling happening on YouTube. And if a similar thing's happening with Netflix, I'm super proud of Netflix for just stepping up and just saying, like, here's the numbers, bro. What's happening with Netflix is a couple of ISPs have accused them of violating net neutrality because of their open connect platform. They say, look, we will give you boxes – 
We don't charge you for this program. We'll install the Netflix equipment in your data center so that your customers can get stuff faster. And Comcast, I believe, particularly has said, but there are costs associated with maintaining those and you don't pay for that. So we have to incur those costs. Therefore, it is tantamount to you charging us to get faster access to your content. Uh, and of right. course, this is from Comcast, who's trying to charge Netflix to access their customers. So it's all a big backbone battle that's kind of Man. beyond the scope of this Show, There's part but, of me that loves the fact that these disputes are being settled in the court of public opinion with PR battles, because I'd much rather see this than legal battles. You know, legal so slow and stupid and easily corruptible. Uh, not that not that PR battles are not all of those things, but at least it's out in the daylight where everyone can see it. Yeah. Well, yeah it, uh, now, apparently he's... Canada does not exist. Uh, there's, I know there's Netflix in Canada. They're not on the ISP speed chart. I don't know why. I haven't seen any reasons explained why Canada doesn't show there. Um, perhaps, as I've often suspected, Canada is a myth. Uh, dude, I've, I thought it was a myth until I set foot in it just this year. This is oh, my no. first. I've been there, but I've also been lots of places, if you know what I mean, that don't exist. No, so. you, ever, you ever notice that you never see Canada and Mexico in the same place? Yeah. <laughs> same... <laughs> just, I, you know, that is a little bit weird. And Mexico's now, on this list. Just saying. See, all right. No, see, I, I consider good. Canada like Brigadoon. It's one of those places that every like, 13, 14 years it shows up and then it. When you leave, it just goes away. Oh, Zach, Dang. I think you mean Chicago. <laughs> yes, that's what you say. Close enough. Freaking do. Yeah, it's a difference. Uh, let's finish up. That's a, it's a uh, by the way, a John Hodgman reference for those who don't get it. Probably not such a big story, but since it's our fourth big story, it gets this. A graphic courtesy of one Zach Holder. Well done, Zach Holder. Woo! <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, the Wired folks have a have a lovely story up about the history of the set top box. We could, we could just throw it up for the video folks and kind of page through the different uh, slides. If you're on the audio version, just go to wired.com, search for the history of the set top box, or go to twit.tv slash fr. Find the link there. Uh, not a big story, but really fun to see these like signal boosters from the 50s and 60s on up to the cable boxes. They even have Pong as one of the first like console games that you could have in your home. Uh, Dude, they I talk about the guy who who ran cable for the first time. There's even a cat. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love that you put in a photo to your Gerald system, the uh, the channel changer. I totally remember it, where it's like you'd have to click on, uh, you'd have to choose banks and then click on various radio buttons to to hone in on your on your freaking. Um, yeah, uh, I don't channel. I don't know what this video is anymore, but uh, go ahead and go to the next uh, link, Jason. The the uh, ISP speed, or I'm sorry, our first cable box was one of these. It's a, it's in the in the yeah there we go. Just take a look. <laughs> to zoom in on it. But that's what uh, Brian's talking about right there. I swear yeah. ours only had twenty four channels, and the only pictures I could find were of these thirty six channel models. Well, that those are the ones I remember. And in fact, what was kind of cool is if you mashed all the buttons fast enough. I remember this. You mashed them all fast enough, it would get like mixed up, and then you could click. Like once it got mixed up. You could click on 24, but you'd get 21 instead. It was like, <laughs> it, was, it was the weirdest, like as a second grader. Like, I'm a hacker. Exactly, right? I thought I was clever back in the day. Oh, yeah. And, there, and that dial, that was a tuner dial on the right there. Yeah. Uh, with Cinemax was channel 17. Uh, and so uh, you could flip channel 17 down and you could sometimes tune that, play with that enough that you could sort of see a picture. Sure, let's say it was Cinemax that you were trying to tune in. That sounds exactly Cinemax. like like the, the the legitimate content that I cuz I know what was on 18. If you know Cinemax was on 17, I know what was on 18. And maybe we that didn't get that in Cable Vision of Greenville. Mm. 18 <laughs> was you know what 18 was? CBN. Mm. Maybe you're trying to sneak in, see a little little topless toaster action. <laughs> <laughs> No, see Christian Broadcast Network, not right, QVC. They're huge. Yeah. <laughs> Big Toaster fans over there. All right, uh, let's take a break. Thank our uh, sponsor, Pond5. How many times do we, Well, there's new people in the audience, so bear with us. But you people who haven't tried out Pond5 yet, I mean, seriously, we, we want to see your videos that you're making with Pond5 or your audio projects or whatever, because this is an explosion of creativity at your fingertips. Right, Brian? I'll tell you what, uh, and I'm really bummed because the folks over at Pond5 are here right now at South by Southwest in Austin. And in fact, they invited me. They were trying to lure me. You'll see on my on my tweet feed. They were like, we've got beer. Come by, Brian. But unfortunately, I'm like, I have to do frame rate. Uh, these guys are rad. They totally get it. They understand that we're entering a new world of content creation where all of a sudden, 
Uh, and I'm convinced that the movies and stories that are going to be told over the next 20 or 30 years are going to be a massive leap forward in their sophistication and execution. And it's because of cheap tools like Pond 5. Back in the 1950s, you had a flood of cheap guitars, electric guitars going out. 15 years later, boom, the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, all these guys. These guys have figured out that there are young cinematographers, young filmmakers who don't have the budget to get a skyline shot of Chicago or Singapore or wherever their story is supposed to take place. But you know what they do have? They got 15 bucks for a, a 30 second high definition clip. They do have two bucks for a loop that they can use in a punk riff that they want to put on there. And in fact, uh, my favorite thing about uh, Pond 5 is something that Eileen told me about. She said, well, you realize you can sort by price. So if you need some music in the background, sort by price, and they got it all laid out. Keep in mind, this is not some giant content farm where they have a bunch of 12-year-olds with guitars trying to make loops that you'll like. These are other people who are passionate about creating it and by creating this stock media marketplace where uh, where they have some of the best rates in the industry, you're a they're able to match you with the people who create this content. And uh, essentially, it's fostering you know, small businesses all across the world, little individuals who have, uh, you know, a, a studio in the background trying to make some extra money. These are the people that you're supporting. And that's what makes me feel so good about the, our friends over at Fawn 5. You know, you, you they'll still give you the beer, even if you don't say all those nice things. But they are true. Uh, dude, uh, I'll, I'm just saying, look what just showed up. I mean, that's... Oh, that's yeah. It's a little fast. Pay for play. Five, you guys are the wizards. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, is that a Shiner Blonde? No, this is the, the Shiner Seasonal Ale. This is their oh, spring seasonal. farmhouse ale, FM 966. Now, uh, the other thing, uh, you may have realized that Brian was saying it was putting you in touch with other people in the creative industry. That means you can sell your stuff, too. They pay out 50% royalties for each and every sale, and you determine the price. So if you're a media maker, artist, or you or otherwise, you should absolutely check out Pond5. This month, you can get 50 free stock media files by going to Pond5.com slash frame rate. That's Pond5.com slash frame rate. Tell Pond5 you support the show. Go use that URL or just say hello to them on Twitter or something. Yeah, we thank them. Right now, tweet them and apologize that I'm not there drinking beer with them. And instead, yeah. I'm drinking beer with you. Brian apologizes that he is not drinking all of Pond5's beer right now. <laughs> Let's move into the slipstream. So we got a lot of slipstreamy stuff today, uh, starting with redesigned YouTube channels. Uh, this is for the creators of the channels, not the viewers of the channels, but the viewers get the benefit if the creator changes it. It gives you a, a big album art up at the top. You can put a trailer up for those who aren't familiar with your channel to try to convince them to subscribe. Uh, it's easier to highlight certain shows on your channel, certain playlists, things like that. I, I like it. I think, I think it looks great. Have you looked at these, Brian? Have you converted yours yet? Well, you, you know, the, the way they did it in beta was that you would just sort of randomly yeah. encounter, all of a sudden you're in the new YouTube format. And uh, uh, because because Revision 3 are the owners of the uh, Scam School page, I haven't talked to them about redesigning it. But I'll tell you what, man, every time I look at these, I love uh, – you, you. Google's doing it right, man. For, for somebody who has a very um, uh, open platform ethos – they're doing a good job of minimizing hideous design choices that come when you have an open platform ethos. And so I, it's, I, I still wish they would make it easier for us to discover shows. I think that's something they can work on as well. But that that doesn't mean that this was a bad idea or anything. In fact, I converted my channel today uh, and I've got a lot of work to do. That's the bad thing is you're like, oh, I should make a trailer. Oh, I need to I, I'll pick some default art for that for that display area at the top. Geek and Sundry did a great thing with that display area. Instead of just putting a big splashy picture, they put the weekly schedule up there. So there's all kinds of creativity that you can you can use in this. It, I think overall people really like it. Uh, YouTube's founder, Chad Hurley, is at South by Southwest right there in Austin. You might look around, keep your eyes open, uh, Brian, you might run into him. He was talking with Kevin Rose of Google Ventures and yep, former heard Dig uh, about his new product. And he said during his Q&A with Rose, he's like, man, I wish South by Southwest was a month later because I could unveil the new product which is primarily video-based and gives flexibility for people to work together and create content. Hmm. Okay, work together so it's some kind of interactive so it's collaborative. thing. Collaborative, yeah. All right, all right. Wait, wait, hey, do you know something? Do you, have, do you know a rumor? Not really, but uh, we've talked about how we've uh, been hosting shows. In fact, um, 
Robert Viegas, uh, Roberto, Roberto Viegas, who's yes. been on the show several times. Um, he, uh, my so-called eight-bit uh, life. Yes, my yes. so-called eight-bit life. Fantastic. Um, he uh, uh, was doing D and D games, uh, showing them on Google Hangouts. Oh, dude, of course. Yeah. And so once you get your players in, you lock it so it's only viewable. You can't join the hangout at that point. And so I'm wondering if if that's kind of where they've kind of baited, like, hey, we can have people do this all through here and just record and broadcast, and then we can do post-editing. Or Yeah. Now, this is not YouTube itself. This Remember, this is a uh, – it's actually a Google Ventures-funded outfit, but it's a separate company called Avos, uh, which owns Delicious, the bookmarking system, and also uh, is uh, – uh, fa- uh, run by Steve Chen, the other co-founder of YouTube. So these guys know know from video. I'll be interested to see. I guess a month from now, what they come up with. Right on. Uh, Rovio is going to launch their TV channel March seventeenth in their app. This is tough. This is yeah. Tough for- uh, it's tough for me to swallow. It's like, uh, look, I get it. You made a great game that involves a slingshot and birds that are pissed off. And yes, you all made us hate those pigs. But like, has any, uh, the, the biggest release since then to, to me looks like Star Wars Angry Birds, which is like, you're doing it wrong. For guys who say they want to be the next Disney, you don't go out and license other people's property and slap them on your same slingshot by game. Disney, oddly yeah. enough, yeah. Exactly. It's like, um... I don't know. I mean, maybe these guys have some fire that that I'm not that I haven't seen yet. But as ambitious they are, as Yoda. Yeah, per- it's did. yeah. It's. I just find it hard because I'm like, well, I do have the Angry Birds game on one of my Roku's, but it's not on all of them because not all of my Roku's support gaming. But but and is it's that only even- there because it was default added when I bought the box? Well, so and, and, I don't think I'm going to make a special effort to go watch their stuff. Whereas if Rovio said, hey, here's our video channel separate, that could be something that gets me thinking about Rovio all the time because I'm like, oh, maybe this is a really funny, you know, cartoon that I really like. And now I'll start wanting to play the games more often. I'll tell you what, Rovio has a bit of a ticking clock where it's like they still have a massive, massive brand momentum. And it could be that whatever idea they're working on is going to be huge enough to catch fire. But we've already seen a couple of releases from Rovio. They didn't go anywhere near as big as Angry Angry Birds. So if they're if they're serious about making an empire, maybe maybe fewer of these bold proclamations of how amazing they're about to be and maybe a little more. Clever rubber band games. I don't care if they proclaim they're going to be awesome or not. Uh, just don't hide your video inside your app. It should, it should work the other way, in my opinion. That's the thing. Like, with, with all the Angry Birds games, they have some opening video or some picture that has to start the game. I cannot tell you how quickly I skip through it. To get- <laughs> exactly. You just want to play the game. You don't want to yes. go, yeah. Exactly. All right. Uh, I guess there, you know, the other side of the argument could be like, oh, well, all your Rovio stuff's in one place. You don't have to go there to play the game. You can just you watch can the videos. But stuff. It seems, seems mean, limited. You mean both your Rovio things? Let's stop saying all your Rovio stuff. Why? You don't like? I don't know. Because like, what? Up? I mean, how many Rovio things do you got? Well, there's uh, the stuffed animals, and there's several games, and there's the videos. That's about it. Right. That's, yeah. that's, that's, you mentioned three. I said two. Close enough. Well, there's three stuffed animals. That's, <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> HBO has told The Verge it will make all new episodes of its original programming available worldwide within a week of release. And in fact, they say they're pushing international outlets to take an air their episodes the same day they release in the U.S., but they're essentially giving them up to a week to put them on because they know that scheduling is different in different parts of the world. But uh, well done. Now, it's funny. HBO says, well, this has nothing to do with combating piracy. Uh, We've always wanted to do this. It was just technically difficult before. I don't know what crazy technology they got a hold of, but I'm glad they're... Oh, they they figured out how to do that. Technology is called a telephone, and they finally picked it up and said, how about we not just artificially hold crap back for no good reason? Because apparently it's the 21st century, so maybe, I don't know, we should react to that. You know, it, there, there could be a reality to this worldwide, uh, because one of the reasons we have regionalism in the first place is because in the past, it did take a long time for the film canisters of a television show or later videotape to be sure. put on a, a cargo plane and then taken by train to the, you know, I mean, there was an actual physical delay. These days with broadband, there's not. 
but maybe not all areas of the world were up to date on being able to accept and deliver higher quality, reliable connections, et cetera, et cetera. And it did take them this while long to make it a worldwide thing. Small moves, Ace Detect. That's what's going to make this happen. And we should applaud them for being slightly less dumb. Congratulations for... Good point. Absolutely. Small less applause. Dumb. For small moves. Uh, Google Fiber TV. i got a couple 3D stories for you, Brian. Google Fiber TV adding 3D channels. So if you're in Kansas City and you're signed up for Google Fiber and you've added the TV channels, you can now get 3Net and ESPN 3D. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was uh, breathing. Um, great. 3D. That's awesome. I can't wait to put goggles on my face and sit there. Awkward. There's also a 3D Go streaming service headed to Vizio TV. Uh, in fact, it's already there, but they're getting Disney movies. So there's actually something you might want to watch on there. Things like Brave, uh, Frankenweenie, some of those, those, those Disney 3D movies. Does that, that get you any more excited, Brian? Uh, wait, 3D Go, that means it's like it goes with me. It's mobile. It's not just in my my home. Yeah, no, anywhere you can take your 54-inch uh, Vizio TV. <laughs> and have internet. It's a, see, it's totally mobile, bro. Just just load the old thing up on the flatbed, take it over to grandma's, put on your goggles, synchronize the Bluetooth. Don't, now, don't, this is smart for them because they will do that when the mobile device, the mobile devices can't handle 3D yet. Why, but, the way, why, but they're ready. They're no. ready with that moment it can. Okay, look, this is a whole it's industry. It's like calling That's... Your, your DVD rental service Netflix. Same okay, kind of you're deal. right. Okay, but the difference is Netflix is awesome and exists. 3D Go, maybe a bit ambitious to say like, well, eventually you'll get 3D on the go. But for now, we're just going to call but, it something that we're not. Netflix didn't always have online streaming. It was just you ordered your DVDs on the net. I mean, I think that's a little. That weird. was close enough. That was at least a thing. Where's no, the go? 3D go Where's argue, the go? Hey, you can go watch 3D right now. 3D could go tell us what the we next are. story is. Is. That's Go what I for 3D. Actually, it's time for tube tops. I find this stupider than 3D Go. Believe me, I think 3D Go is actually pretty awesome. But TiVo Mini? All right. I love the idea to begin with, right? It's a little Roku-sized TiVo box that you it's can put extender, in your spare right? rooms, and it extends your TiVo. So you can get all of the uh, – anything you record on your TiVo in the other room – it doesn't have Netflix. It's $100, and you have to pay $6 a month to use it. <laughs> wow. You had me up until those last sentences. <laughs> like, everything about it sounded awesome. You're like, it costs pretty much as much as a TiVo. Also, please, like, why, why would you not just get another TiVo at this point? Well, the, the, the TiVos are, are a little more expensive. They're around $200, $250. But still, like, this is, like, the most expensive Roku, and it doesn't have the features of the most expensive Roku. And you got to pay. Uh, why am I paying six dollars a so, month? I get why I'm paying a monthly fee on my TiVo for your guide data. That is sure. fair. But why am I paying a monthly fee for the other thing to bring the guide data in from the other room, which I can do myself? I can build my own extender. It's my own network. It's transmitting over my network the data I already pay for you to send me. I don't get that at all. It's a sling box. No, it's not a sling box. It's basically a sling box. Yeah, also, a sling box you don't pay a monthly fee for. <laughs> so you're saying there's, it's a, there's it's a difference. Worse don't pay a, a monthly fee for it. Sling box. All right, that's great. <laughs> I guess it is kind of a sling box, but yeah, there's that still doesn't explain the monthly fee. I don't know. Uh, the other and the other one we've got today is the Roku Three. Uh, Roku Three went on sale for ninety nine dollars. Upgraded CPU. They've got a brand new UI. People are very excited about this. A couple of nifty other features. Uh, there's a headphone jack on the remote. So that you can actually listen to what's on your Roku over your headphones what? without yes. having it come out of your TV. That that is the one thing I was most excited about when I first you know read that it was coming out. I was like, wait, 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 wait. So I can watch something, plug in the headphones, and not annoy the other people in the room who are possibly trying to sleep or do something else. That's I love this. I love this. Is there anything like that that's been out before? I mean, I've never heard of anything. No, I've one of the problems with this is uh, is your remote doesn't have any way usually to receive the signal, but they put Wi-Fi in here. That's Wi-Fi Direct. This yeah, is right. not to be confused with HDMI over Wi-Fi. This is is actually Wi-Fi Direct, and I think Wi-Fi is the HDMI, so I just confused you. This is Wi-Fi Direct. <laughs> what it is is the remote communicates with a Wi-Fi signal directly to the Roku. It doesn't go over your home network, though. 
It just goes this, direct. So there's no line of sight. You could turn on RDO on your Roku, plug in the headphones, walk around the house. As long as you're within range of Wi-Fi, you're getting your signal. It's, I'll tell you what. It's similar to, to the uh, Zigbee setup that they, they use with like the um, LED lights you can you know, program from your iPad or iPhone. It's the same thing. It creates its own network. Right. Well, and, and here's the thing is, is uh, as much of an eye roller like what? Headphones and a remote? What does that matter? It's these small structural improvements that make the access easy enough to take advantage of that, that matter hugely in the long term. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to see this. And Brian Heater from Engadget was on Tech News Today the day this story came out. He said he got to play around with one, and it's a little heavier than the older Roku, which both he and I were excited about because the current Roku, if your HDMI cable is stiff and gets a kink in it, it'll like it, launch your Roku up in the air and you can't get it to set flat. Uh, uh, dude, it's, it's got so the, the tilt going on. like. But we're not even talking about the interface. The interface is totally rejuvenated. It's going to roll out to the previous generation Rokus, not the original generation, but the Roku 2s coming in April. And it's no longer that long strip. Across the front, you get a nice tile interface on the left and whatever you're selecting on the right. Uh, they're just making it a lot easier to use as a search engine so you can take advantage of that that kind of universal search across all kinds of apps, take advantage of trying out apps that maybe you haven't installed. Uh, that was the one advantage I could think of for the Western Digital Play. That and WD Play has YouTube, and Roku just took away that advantage. If Roku would freaking get YouTube as an app, They'd, they'd win this kind of box competition, hands down. Yeah. How How is it that they haven't? Like, you would think, like, I mean, does Google have an axe to grind? What's going on? I I hear lots of different explanations for it, and I'm not sure which one to believe. Some say there's a spat between Roku and YouTube. Uh, I really haven't heard any credible people say that. More of the credible explanations are that YouTube is requiring certain features for rolling in their ads that Roku is underpowered to deliver a good app for. And so they're waiting for Roku to be updated. Maybe Roku 3 will get the YouTube app. Now we've got this upgraded processor. We'll have to see. All right, we'll have to see. Let's move to the film foul. Looks like uh, Redbox and Netflix are going to get into the content creation game next. Uh, creative Ar artist agency lawyer Peter Maselli was speech speaking at UCLA's Entertainment Symposium on Friday and said that Redbox and Verizon have been inquiring about original programming opportunities, essentially doing what Netflix did and saying, hey, someone who knows how to do this, go produce us an amazing show so we can feature it exclusively on our service. Yeah, do you know who is the single most happiest person to hear this news? I imagine most executive producers who like bidding wars for their products would be happy, but which one are you thinking of? Nope, it's Netflix, because Netflix, it basically means that they they did it again. They managed to do two in a row. They needed they pioneered, uh, you know, DVD uh, through the mail. They pioneered uh, direct uh, d delivery of movies. They made a bold decision, and it turns out they're pioneering non-network distribution for high-quality projects, and the fact that other people are jumping on the bandwagon <laughs> Uh, completely solidifies this win for them. Uh, the second place most happy people should be the consumers because it means that now that there's other players, it's going to keep Netflix honest where they can't get fat and sassy saying that, uh, well, we just make stuff and it's awesome all the time. So uh, I, this, is, this is good all around. It's like we're watching the future that we've described for years unfolding before our eyes. I bet if somebody were industrious enough, they could go back into the frame rate archives and find one of us saying, you know, someday X will happen and it will be all of these stories. It'll be Nielsen rating things. It'll be other companies besides Netflix doing original programming. It will be fights over a la carte. I mean, you know, I'm not saying that we've predicted everything correctly, but there are certain things we've said this is going to have to happen for things to progress. And they're starting to happen. It's a good time to be frame rate is all I'm saying. If what you care about in life is being right, because so far uh, we've we've had a pretty good track record and it's good to see that uh, maybe, I mean, there's some part of me, like by and large, I'm bitter and jaded, but there's a part of me that just my little heart flutters and I'm like, maybe it's happening. You yeah, because it always happens a lot slower than you want it to. And oh, man, how long have we been doing this show? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Too long. Too early. We started too early. All right. What's this sci-fi story? Uh, no, it's uh, a, 
It is a good day to rate frames. Uh, Sci-Fi greenlit a new Battlestar Galactica creator Ronald D. Moore show called Helix. It apparently has to do with a virus out of control, disease outbreak, Antarctica, terrifying blah, life. Blah, blah, blah. You said Ronald D. Moore, which is the secret word of the day. Woo! <laughs> Dude, all I know is that Ronald D. Moore makes gold he was he was awesome uh in his work on star trek the next, next generation and some problems notwithstanding on battlestar galactica all i know is rdm he gets it he was the one to pioneer the second screen uh every time a new episode of battlestar galactica would come out he would release yep. the director's commentary the next day so that i would end up watching all the episodes twice <laughs> i trust that guy he's not led me astray just yet I think the other thing that's cool about this are the other EPs. Linda Opst from Contact, the movie Contact, and Stephen Medea, who was a co-exec producer on Lost, as well as uh, he was a, a story editor on X-Files, is joining in on the creation of this. So it's a good team. See, this is weird, though, because it almost sounds... I mean, maybe maybe our audio connection's a bit screwy, but it almost sounded like the... Uh, uh, Siffy is the name of this network... Uh, is suddenly getting into science fiction, which just doesn't... I've, I've never... What, aren't they a, like a wrestling channel? I yeah. Think? They, 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 well, they, well, no, they do reality shows, too. Um, oh, yeah. yeah the, it's the, so the, weird, though. A wrestling and reality TV channel moving into science fiction. Who knows? Maybe it'll turn into something. Yeah. Look forward to it. There's Sophie. a chance. Well, we've got some good news and some bad news about the forthcoming Star Wars sequels, uh, and they're all the same news because it depends on who you are. Mark <laughs> Hamill... Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher all on board for Star Wars Episode Seven. Good news or bad news for you, Brian? It depends on how ham hand. Okay, you know what? Here's the thing. Hamel if George hand. Lucas was in charge, it would be bad, bad, bad news as far as I could tell. However, I mean, the last decade, Disney's batting a thousand. Everything they touch turns to awesome. Well, if and they who's directing this? J.J. freaking Abrams, who's also batting a thousand. He's never made a crappy movie that I've seen. I defy you. Name one absolutely name one jj abrams anything that is as bad as the star wars prequels and that's the end of the discussion as far as i'm concerned so here's the thing i trust these guys they're gonna have them be in there they're gonna have a felicity that was really but old they're gonna have them play their kind of old tired roles if you read the uh the the thrawn trilogy then you get an idea for an older more tired han solo like seeing them as aging 60-year-old diplomats, I think will be nice if it's handled correctly and there could be a passing of the torch to, guess what, a new story that'll blow us away. Uh, I'm very, very optimistic about all this. What about you, Zach? I'm looking forward to it a lot. Uh, I do like the idea of aging them much more, and, and even if, if need be, using them more in, in a callback-type reference instead of, you know, actually, like, you know, maybe, yes, ha have, you know, an, an older Han, an older Leia, but you know, maybe have you know Luke now has passed on, so he so this, or he's at the end of his of, of his time. So sure, you mean he's so, become more powerful than you possibly could imagine, dude. What it, would it be great if like like they never they never acknowledged it or said anything, but just blue Luke is a blue ghost the yeah, entire time. They don't, it, like like guess what? Time's passed, and I don't know. I had pancreatic space cancer, and <laughs> here we are. I mean, and Leia's like, can I get you something to eat? Oh, sorry, <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> Okay, which is the better slash worst news, this first story or the follow-up here? Uh, oh, yes. A, uh, a new direction for Lucasfilm anim animation means that there are only going to be, what, one or two more Star Wars Clone Wars series, and they are not going to do uh, the uh, the Star Wars detours that involved yes. Seth Green. Now, you're you're upset about this. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? So here's the thing. I hear great things about the Clone Wars. I, I hear like they're they're trying to, they, they did their best to work within the structure they were given and make things right. And I know that a lot of people like Clone Wars, yeah. uh, but but also they're on the Cartoon Network, not on a Disney channel. And now that Disney owns them, makes sense for them to sunset the Clone Wars, which fine, let's have a new story with new characters and do new things. Uh, meanwhile, technically they're not killing detours, which may be the single Star Wars project I hated they're the shelved. most. In my they're entire. Yes. Uh, well, they're saying it's uh, they're putting it on pause, basically, which means hopefully it'll go direct to DVD and be something that nobody ever really looks at. But they that the exact quote is what I love is they said uh, Lucasfilm has reconsidered whether launching an animated comedy prior to the launch of Star Wars Episode Seven makes sense. Good on you, Lucasfilm. Well, 
We, this, this, yeah. yeah, in all seriousness, this is almost a non-story to me because what it is is, oh, when Disney wasn't in here with all its money, this was the best we could do, and this is what we were planning, and we were trying to make a live-action series, but we just couldn't get it off the ground, and so we had to settle for this. Now we have Disney money, we're making sequels, we're making a freaking live-action series, and why would we mess around with this stuff anymore when we don't have to? Uh, sure. That's that, that's another way to say the same thing. But I'll tell you what, it matters if what you're doing is following the story of uh, the, the rebirth of Lucasfilm as to a trusted content provider that will be uh, consistent in its direction and artistic vision, then this is great, great news. And I'm, I think it's a big deal. I'm very excited about it. By the way, I wanted to see Carrie Fisher, Mark Hamill, and Harrison Ford in the new Star Wars. I want it to be handled right I, I also worry that it could be handled badly and it would be awful. But it, if it handled right, I think it's better than anything. Absolutely. I, th I think so, too. I think it could be handled uh, very So let's talk about the uh, the video we started the show with, the uh, School of Thrones parody. Some big-name YouTube folks in here. Uh, if, you, if you haven't been following the Lizzie Bennett Diaries, go watch it. Great series on YouTube, uh, and it was up for a bunch of IWTV awards. Uh, so it, it, there's some, some good folks with some good experience here. What did you think of the clips that we saw. Okay, so I actually, I picked my favorite little one-minute chunk for, to play for the beginning, and uh, I, th I think I'm, I, I'm into what they're trying to do, but I'm utterly fascinated uh, as to how long they're going to be able to get away with it because uh, we have a lot of parody videos on YouTube. It's sort of become established. Like, yes, you can take the Bane clip and Adam freestyling, and now that's its own standalone thing or whatever, but you couldn't take a whole series and say now i'm doing my own series about bane a licensed property who freestyle raps across america like at some point they're gonna shut you down on this and i'm curious like this is this is the announcement of a beginning of a series recasting the existing story the existing characters that are trademarked and copyrighted by uh, uh you know george r. r martin and 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 hbo recasting them as a high school click story and uh i i just I can't believe that they're just going to let them keep on making this, especially if well, it turns Brian, out. You're, 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 I mean, I don't know the story behind uh, this either, but you're jumping to a conclu uh, conclusion that they haven't gotten permission. Well, certainly it was not part of the story, and that's the kind of thing well, I, I can not It was a Daily Beast story about this amazing show. Sure. Uh, it may be just like, well, obviously, if they're going to put this out, they would have got permission because I'm a mainstream reporter and no one would do that otherwise. And, and, they, and they just dropped that fact. But the, they, George R. R. Martin says that he does not like fan fiction. Uh, my guess is if you're going to do this and you're going to be this high profile about it, you kind of have to go to George R. R. Martin and say, hey, you cool with this? And he is cool with that kind of thing. He likes parody. He likes jokes. So I could see him easily going like, oh, yeah, that's probably fair use anyway. You got my blessing. Go do it. Uh, that's I don't know, man. That's that's tough. Like, I don't I know could... why you're jumping to the conclusion that they're going to get shut down. They would. This would already be a problem. Uh, to make all this work, they basically have to dance over a very, very fine line because. No, it's parody. Actually, it's a, the, the only fine line they have to dance over is YouTube. The fact that they've actually got it up on YouTube makes me think that they've got permission because uh, this is clearly parody. They they've got uh, they've got a very oh, firm legal okay. defense. So so you're telling me that if somebody were to uh, make a parody of Frame Rate, where it's like it's Tom as a black Rastafarian and Brian as an Indian who works at a convenience store, uh, it's parody. And then they just repeat all the things that we do and tell a story. Uh, but I don't think that's what things. I don't think that's what's going on here, Brian. Sure? What they're because doing that is they're, they're taking. Well, <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would watch that. What show. I'm saying is. What if someone on a national network uh, did a live performance every week that took the names and characters of other networks' television shows and dressed up like them and imitated them and spoke their lines, but it was for comedic effect? Would they be able to get away with that? No. Every week, live. That, that's that's Saturday nights. Oh, I see what you did there. This is a good question. But... Again, that's a fair, uh, it's not though because they don't because they're don't, not telling the same story. These are kids with the same names. They don't even have the same appearances as the HBO show. But they're riffing on the same. Oh, I don't know, man. This is this is one for a headier person than I me. Think you want it to be, but it it's just it's just not. 
And Man. and again, I think they may have approached some people and said, "Hey, you know, we're cool. You're, we're cool with this, right?" That could be, but I would have imagined wouldn't that have been part of the story? Like, am I the only one who did, thought to ask? Or I, I you know, when I I, I got to say, when I read this, it went through my head too. Like, you know, I wonder if they uh, if they got sign off on this because they're using the character names. Um, but I was like, but it's clearly parody. I mean, they're in a school. They're just joking around with those same How, themes. They're okay, not so imagine, telling the story. This is yeah. not undermining the market for Game of Thrones, either the HBO show or the book. I mean, they meet all the fair use criteria here. Okay, but let's say, uh, let's say fantasy, crazy world, right? Not that this would happen, but what if this became more popular than Game of Thrones? All of a sudden, the comedy writing was so good that people loved this idea of that doesn't uh, matter before the law. What matters is did it undermine the market for Game of Thrones? It's not about popularity. That the no. courts don't care. What what matters is did Game of Thrones suffer? Would they have sold more television shows? Would they have sold more books if this work had not been created? based okay. on it and well, is there no other defense and the other thing is well it doesn't matter possibly whether they undermine the market or not because their defense may be this was commentary this was parody we weren't telling the same story uh, and now, that is fair use as well oh man i don't i don't know i i gotta feel like it's stickier than you're making it because i can't imagine a world where this becomes so successful that they start writing books of the further adventures of the Greyjoy uh, ah, twins or whatever. They start writing books, they're in a different market, and that's a different thing. Well, I mean, you, you we have parody books all the time. We have parody books of Fifty sure. Shades of Grey. Or, you, or, you might be able to have a, a defense there, but then, but then you're also talking about directly competing with the market for the Game of Thrones books, but they still might pass it. I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I, I should make that very clear. I'm just making all no, this stuff you totally up. totally are so. a lawyer. Just the other day, you're like, but by I, the way, I'm think, a Brian, lawyer. I think you're so conditioned to want to cry foul at this just, kind of stuff because we are so often inundated with unfair punishments for things getting taken down off YouTube with by the robot or DMCA notices being sent out and this combative right. enterprise that we've lost sight of what actually is fair. All right, let, 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 let me be very, very to clear. even conceive that someone would go about it the right way and get permission. Understand, understand, to be totally fair here, I am not uh, saying this is a bad idea. I'm not saying I don't love it. I do love it. I think it's great. <laughs> I think it's a good idea. But I have, n I cannot name a single other thing that has been a parody as a series that kept on going. Can you think of anything that matches that that mold? The, the, that week That's over week. They would build well, their that own does, character. That, doesn't, that makes no – just because no one's done it doesn't mean it's not legal. Okay, but, but – And also Saturday Night Live is a series, and it's it's all, been on for over, you know, but 30 they, years. They keep coming back week after week with the same story and, and telling their own story. This is – That this doesn't is, matter. I, One instance is just as illegal as many instances. That, that doesn't make any difference about whether it's fair use or not. Uh, all right. That's fair enough. That's uh, – I, I – I'm curious why you don't think this is interesting. It's so weird to me. This is something that that you just admitted we've never seen before. I don't know. Let's just. Oh, well, you... we've seen lots of this. I, I don't. I don't know why you're. I guess I, I've seen lots of people attempt this. I think this one has one of the better chances of being successful. You're positing all these things like it becomes more popular than Game of Thrones, and they put out books. I mean, I think the guys who do School of Thrones would be would be psyched for all of those things to happen, but it's not a lock. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I don't. Well, think there's a whole Harry Potter series that we featured before that, that makes fun of Harry Potter, and you didn't, you didn't come up with these objections then or these concerns. Same sort of thing. But it, it was a one-off or a series where no, every it was a week series. we talked about it on Frame Rate during Film Valve. I don't remember this show Frame Rate that you're talking about. <laughs> I look forward to checking it out someday. Uh, my counsel says that I do not recall ever being on Frame Rate. <laughs> Uh, hey, can, can can I give you a plug against your will? <laughs> Probably you give, that did you not give me out. a plug with my blessing, actually. As long as we give Kanata equal plug. All right, uh, let's do let's do a quick moment and talk about what a wonderful wish making factory Kickstarter is. Uh, the day after we did Frame Rate last week, uh, Jeff Kanata announced the launch of his next project, the sequel slash follow up to uh, the Totally Rad Show. Of course, uh, Dan Trachtenberg's uh, directing Why the Last Man. Uh, Alex Albrecht is always off doing. Uh, amazing directing things on his uh meanwhile like i talked to jeff canada and jeff canada truly loved truly deeply in his heart loved 
the experience of Totally Rad Show and wished that he could just keep doing it. And it killed me to see him with a hole in his heart. And I'm so thrilled that he put out this uh, this this Kickstarter for the next thing that would that would carry the torch and continue to be a passionate pro geek. Uh, thing whether it's you know anything from video games to to comic books to all the stuff that the Totally Rad Show covered, he asked for twenty thousand dollars and was double funded in twenty four hours. Right now, having started at, to asking for twenty thousand, he's now at eighty three, eighty four thousand, eighty seven thousand uh, six hundred thirty nine on my count. Okay, so here's the thing: uh, he has he's blown away because he legitimately didn't think this was happened, but he did point out that the there's a cultural significance there's it's a different story when you go to a network and talk about how well I asked for 20,000 and I got a lot more than 20,000 but it's different when you say I asked for 20,000 um in 30 days I got 100,000 like that six digits matters so he's setting up uh he's tripling his commitment of episodes if you want to donate uh Jeff's a really really cool guy uh also two very very cool people who definitely deserve do you have details is your thing out yet uh, not yet. Not quite yet. Uh, Len Peralta and I are working on a comic book together. The teaser is available. If you go to Len Peralta's Twitter feed or mine uh, and page back, you'll find links to it all over for the past couple of days. And tomorrow morning at, I think, 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern time, Len's going to push the thing live. And we're going to do a Kickstarter to create at least three issues of the series and uh, you know, we have some stretch goals to do up to 10 issues in an entire season of the series. And we got lots of cool things. Len is great at being like, hey, you know, back us at a certain level and I'll, I'll like put you in the comic book. I'll, you know, I'll draw a picture of you in the background or we'll create a character for you. And uh, he'll, he'll do like original art of the characters in the book, which are amazing. He's got examples of them up on the Kickstarter. So keep an eye on that. It's going to be launching tomorrow morning. And, and I'll announce it on my Twitter feed, twitter.com slash ace detect. Uh, maybe I'll put it on. On Tom Merritt too, since it's important, and uh, Len Peralta, L E N P E R A L T A. Wait, is the, is the is that the only project? Don't you have another thing that maybe involves someone I know? A thing? Yeah, but I I, I want to save that because I got to spread my Kickstarter love around. But uh, right. FSL Tonight fans, stay uh, just tuned. just be ready. Just be ready. If you love you some FSL Tonight as I do, then yes, be yeah. ready. That is going to happen. That's I mean I don't want to be too coy about it. There's a Kickstarter for FSL Tonight coming next week. <laughs> For goodness sake. Actually, it's probably coming by the end of this week. So, awesome. I don't know. We're asking for a lot of money all at once. It's a horrible strategy. As we shift over to uh, premiering this week, uh, J uh, Jason, I'm I'm not getting video anymore. So, if you could restart yeah, that. Yeah, me either. Yeah. Let's take a okay. look at uh, what's premiering this week. Premiering this week. This is what's premiering this week. Check it out. Uh, Red Dawn is premiering this week. Don't go no. see it. Now, let's talk no. about what we're watching. That's okay. <laughs> done and done. <laughs> watching so i know south by southwest is going on brian you probably haven't had a lot of time to watch anything Did, have you watched anything i i've re-watched you've heard me talking about regular show i re-watched like six episodes because i wanted to force Justin robert young to see them so that's happened uh in and just now as i walked upstairs the kids just got uh wreck it ralph and i really enjoyed re-watching the first half i'll tell you what man movies especially kids movies get an automatic upgrade when they're on this tiny cute box in your living room uh, versus, yeah. you know, a big commitment emotionally when you spend money and go to the theater. What about you, Zach? You watching anything? Um, I've been watching The Walking Dead. I have not seen this week's episode because I've been South by Southwest, but I have it on my phone, so I want to watch it once I'm done with this. I do need to know if, if remember last week we talked, Tom, you were saying that if you had two awesome episodes in a row, you'd tell me to jump back in. So I'm curious to know how, how things are at with The Walking Dead. Uh, yes, we are... Two thirds of the way there, Brian. Okay, so <laughs> it was almost a good episode. <laughs> well, no, it was a great, it was a great episode. But here's the problem: that the episode two weeks ago was almost. I'm like, if they bring it home, if they bring this home, sure. I'm going to recommend this. This week was like the second of three acts, essentially. Oh. So All not right. a lot happens, although the dramatic tension was amazing. This wasn't, we're sitting around the farmhouse, not a lot happens, and we got a thumbs up. Or, no, this was, this was 
fantastic meeting of the governor uh, and and Rick for the first time. I know that's a little bit of a spoiler, but you knew it was going to happen. It happens in this episode, uh, and it's just intense. So I'm waiting until next week. If they All bring right. it home next week. I'm holding up. Then, I'm, I'm holding up. Yeah. I'm crossing my fingers. I hope you're right. Uh, somebody sent us a nasty gram, and by someone, I mean me, accusing me of having a ADD and unable to follow through on things. Uh, because it's like, understand, I'm not giving up on The Walking Dead because I can't be bothered to stay focused. I'm giving up on The Walking Dead because I deeply, deeply loved the the 70 plus issues I'd read before the comic even came out. I'm deep, you know, I'm I'm. I'm giving up on it because I deeply love the long form narrative of after having read all of the books of the Game of Thrones series about having finished all of the gunslinger. Like I love, I love well-told, very long, very epic stories as a fan of Peter F. Hamilton. It's just the inconsistency of the characters. It's the all over the mapness. It's the rubbery nature of like dead, not dead, back, not dead. You know, uh, it's uh, uh, that is what has me on pause with The Walking Dead. And I spent a full season and a half apologizing for it. Just taking a break right now. That's all that's going on here, bro. I don't think we've got enough time to do this Nielsen email justice. I want to hold it until next week because I really, I, I almost want to make this into a segment. This is an amazing description of how Nielsen works. Should we? Can we hold off on it? Do you think? I think it's a great idea. We could tease next week by saying that somebody sent us an anonymous email saying, "Please don't say my name," but I'm going to describe in detail all of the gizmos they attach to do the Nielsen thing, all the rules they have, how much you're compensated, all of that stuff. Uh, really fascinating. Uh, which, since it's anonymous. Maybe it's all a big lie, but no, it's up? actually all true. I can I can confirm that it's all true because I you know working at Tech TV, we worked with Nielsen, and this is exactly what they described that they do when they My explain was, how they go and do the measurement. So it's awesome to get a confirmation from somebody who is like, oh yeah, yeah, I was the family. This is what I had to do. So I can't I can't wait to go through this. Uh, Zach, Zach also just pointed out that when he was a kid, his, his family was a Nielsen family. He verified all of that stuff as being accurate to nice. his yeah. experience as well. So uh, we have okay. independent confirmation. Little, little bit of feedback? Is that what I'm feeling? Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Are we going to finish with William, the hit bliss? That's what I'm thinking. All right. Uh, he said, I had a comment on hit bliss. Uh, I, I was uh, allowed into the beta. Oh, wait, no. And I had a comment on the hit list portion that you were talking about. What if in addition to either watching the ads to build up money to watch shows or just plain purchase the content, you linked your account with Amazon, Google Shopping, or even brick-and-mortar stores, Target, Walmart, et cetera? By going to these stores online or on the ground, companies would be able to see real-world purchasing. I mean, we are already selling our information to get things for free anyway. If I want to watch the newest episode of Community, and instead of watching a commercial for Pizza Hut, I could just order a pizza – and get the next three episodes for free, wouldn't that be a better option? The customer gets the content. The advertisers get the real-world numbers on what we are purchasing. Win, win. What do you think? This is brilliant. I, I'm in. This I'm is in. this is the best idea I've ever seen. This is like um it uh, and we and people will say, well, this is a precedent. This is what you already have when you buy a coupon from uh or when you buy a pizza from Pizza Hut, they include a coupon for a DVD or whatever. We're not talking about coupons. I'm talking about direct real world. Like you now own a thing because you bought another thing and it's available at a place. I would love to see that all in one place. And again, that's what's that's what Hit Bliss offers is. A marketplace where you could build up credits to buy uh, real digital media of value. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. I mean, I, it, and obviously there are some complications to negotiating these kinds of buys. That would be sure. the only thing that would hold it up is like verification. How does the purchasing system work? It's a lot easier to roll in a 30 second ad somewhere than it is to actually like have a delivery system for pizzas, et cetera. Uh, but as a consumer, hell yeah, I totally love this idea uh, for the right things. There are plenty of things I don't want to order and those would be useless, but that's no different than seeing an ad for something you don't care about. So sure. Sure. Zach Holder, uh, lovely to have you along for the ride today. Thanks, man. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Can I can I make an announcement on your behalf, Zach? Uh, Zach, as you guys have seen, ha does a bunch of the intros for all of my favorite stuff that we've had, uh, both here on Frame Rate on NSFW. Super talented 3D guy. Uh, like something, Zach's always too busy doing big big other projects, but for the first time, he can take like uh, like commissions now. So if you dig. Zach's motion graphics and and uh, is there a place people can see your demo reel? Uh, actually, I actually don't I don't have one up yet. That's uh, this worst marketing ever. I, you gotta make up a URL 
and 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 right now, and we'll register it and point it to your demo. What? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll choose one uh, offline. HireZachHolder.com. <laughs> now available by the time you hear this. HireZachHolder.com. I hope somebody else doesn't. Do, or just look for Zach Holder online. He's amazing. Yeah. And uh, uh, You can find me on Twitter at Lonely.Geek. Lonely.Geek. There spelled you go. Out, so. Awesome. Hire Zach Holder, please. And also... Go watch Frame Rate over and over again. Twit.tv slash FR is the place to do it. We stream live. If you watch it on demand, you want to be in with the chat room. We do it on Mondays at 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Eastern. You can also email us. Our email address is framerate at twit.tv. We'll see you next time.